Well, listen, we've been uh, in a series on the book of Hebrews that we then took a substantial pause from throughout the holidays and up until now. In the course of our series, we took a pause for our time of prayer and fasting. And I trust that you were engaging in prayer and fasting. I've been told if you need more space, the youth have left, so you feel free to move down here. <laughs> but I trust that in the time of prayer and fasting that you were involved in that, spending time in prayer and surrender to the Father and hearing his voice. In addition, we went through a time of prayer and fasting, but also into our core values as the International Church here in Barcelona. Every year we begin doing just that reminding us of who we are and who God has called us to be as a community of faith. And so if you missed any of that, please catch up, follow along with where we are. But we've been in this journey through the book of Hebrews, and uh, many of you said, when are we going back to Hebrews? Good news, right now. And so we'll be jumping back into the book of Hebrews. If you remember, the author of Hebrews was writing to the Jewish audience who had been following Christ, but now we're at a place in time in their walk with him where they were considering turning back, giving up, considering not pushing forward and pursuing this relationship. And so the author of Hebrews reaches out and says, look, you have to remember that Jesus is better. Christ above all, he's the better sacrifice, he's the better king, he's the better priest, he's better sacrifice that he gave his life for us and offers hope. In every way, he is better. And so as we're looking at the scriptures, we see time and time again where we see Jesus reaching into our story and saying, look, you can rely on yourself or the way things used to be, or you can trust that I'm better and that I'll help you along this journey. This morning, as we're jumping back into Hebrews, we're going to be going straight into the second half of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five, where we look at Jesus, the high priest. I know many of you are like, yes. Right? How many of you know and understand Jesus as high priest? Two of you. How many of you are like, I have no idea what that means? The rest of us. Right, so let's do this. Let's pray and let's jump into looking at what the scriptures have to say as Jesus as our high priest, okay? Christ, we thank you. We thank you because you have given us hope and life, joy and peace. We thank you because mercy and grace are available to us, forgiveness and life that is truly life, you make available to each and every one of us. And we thank you because you don't just leave us to try and figure this out on our own, but you walk with us and you speak to us and you guide us along this journey. Father, as we look to this scripture today about Jesus, the high priest, I pray you would speak to us. I pray that you would take us deeper in our walk with you. And I pray we would understand you in a deeper, more profound way. And that as we apply what we're going to learn today to our day-to-day -day lives, may we see you at work when we step into what you're calling us into. God, we love you. We trust you. Speak to us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Have you ever had something that you loved? Something that you just thoroughly enjoyed? Something that on a regular basis you would like to eat or partake in or eat or enjoy or eat? And then one day you learned that it wasn't everything you thought and hoped it would be. Anyone? I had this experience a few years ago with uh, these bad boys. How many of you like Doritos? Be honest. All right. There you go. Listen, I used to love Doritos. I used to eat these all the time. I thought these go good with a two liter of Coca-Cola. They go good with a two liter of Coke Zero. They go good with a two liter of Fanta. They go good with anything, right? If you're eating pizza, make it worse, Doritos, right? <laughs> if you're driving in your car or walking through the city or on the metro, Doritos. And Brandy had a different philosophy. She would eat things like grapes, whatever, <laughs> carrots, different things that were much healthier, and she would make fun of me. She would say, John, you've got to stop. That's not good for you. And I said, look, you choose your snack, I choose mine. And she asked me a question. She said, have you ever read the fine print on the back? And I said, no, no one does that. It ruins everything. And so she kept eating her snacks. I kept eating mine. And then one day I picked it up and read the back of it. And I found out that this little bag that I would eat as a snack before I had my real meal had like a third of the calories I was supposed to have for the whole day in one little bag. 
and that there was something called gene-altered grains and wheats. I don't even want to know what that means. And other things I couldn't pronounce, and then she started sending me through her grandmother, allegedly had nothing to do with it, articles about eating healthy and about the things we put in our body. And the more that I read the fine print, the less and less I wanted to eat these wonderful, horrible Doritos. Who likes Doritos still? You do? There you go. I'm not going to be able to eat them, so enjoy. You can eat them now during the service. A little snack midway. <laughs> if you've ever had something like that, that when you read the fine print, maybe it changes you to where you don't want to do it or partake in it anymore. Well, this morning we're going to look at some fine print that will actually help us hopefully understand and engage in a greater way. If you've ever had a moment where you missed the importance of something, you know what this is like. Every year, when I give my wife any kind of technology for her birthday or Christmas, I experience this moment. When she goes, thanks, what does it do? I'm like, it's awesome. She's like, I'm sure I'll enjoy it one day. <laughs> and sometimes we miss the point of what we're reading. Sometimes when we look at this scripture, specifically the one we're looking at today and others like it, where we see words like the great high priest, it's lost on us, right? There are a few of us in the room that might study theology or, or like to read word studies and commentaries, and you might say, well, I know what it means, John. But for the majority of us, we don't understand the nuance of this scripture. Because as it begins to talk about Jesus being our great high priest, how many of you have no idea what that means? Most of us. Why is that? Here's why. Because there hasn't been a high priest since the destruction of the temple, and that was some time ago. And so when the destruction of the temple took place, there were no longer high priests. And so really to be able to understand what the author of Hebrews is saying, we've got to look deeper, okay? We've got to understand what a high priest is, what his function was, and what that means for us as Jesus takes on this role in our lives. Otherwise, we miss the beauty of why this is so exciting. The author says, he's our great high priest. And there's much celebration to be had in what he's saying but so often we miss it, and we read it and say, he's a high priest, keep going, because I don't know what that means. If we're not careful, you and I miss the importance of having a high priest. But here's the truth, as we look at these scriptures today, we'll come to realize that our high priest, Jesus, is not a distant figure, but he is a daily reality. He's not just a distant figure, he's a daily reality that is available to us and that he wants to walk with us on a regular basis. So let's start here. First of all, I want to look at what was a high priest? What was his function? Why did he exist? And what did that mean for the people of Israel? And then we'll compare that to Jesus as our high priest in just a few moments. So first of all, let's look to the scripture, to Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 1. He says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God and offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. So he's saying, look, he's human. He's flawed. He's weak. He's still this human high priest has to offer sacrifice for himself. That's why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on themselves, but they receive it when they're called and appointed by God. Okay, so high priests existed all throughout Scripture. They existed as the ultimate authority on all things religious and biblical in nature. They were the ultimate authority that would represent the people to God. So they were the highest of all the priests. Many other priests would be at work in the temple, at work in the synagogues, and there in day-to-day in -day life. But this was the ultimate authority, the highest honored priest among them. The people of Israel would go to the high priests for several reasons. I want to look at those this morning. If you're taking notes, write these down. If you didn't bring something to write with, take pictures with your phone or lock it into mental memory. But these are the reasons why the people of Israel would go to the high priests. The first thing is this, to know the will of God. To know the will of God. How many of you know we need to know what God wants for us? It's important that when we're seeking wisdom and guidance and direction, that we have a way of understanding what it is that God has for us or wants for us or is inviting us into. And in the time of the high priest, the people of Israel would go to the high priest when they were seeking him for God's will, for wisdom, for direction. In Numbers 27, verse 21, we see an example of that with the Ermin and the Thummin. I think that's how you pronounce it. If not... 
Susan will tell you afterwards. But, but these are things that we see throughout Scripture where they say the priest would have this fixed on his breastplate and he would go and meet with the people and they would seek wisdom, direction, advice, the will of God. And as this representative of God to the people was there, they could have this connection where they could find out what his will was. The second thing they would go to him for was as a connecting point between God and man. As you know, there was a rift that happened in humanity. When sin enters the world with Adam and Eve, we see that there is this disconnection, this separation that happens between God and man, right? We've talked about this before, that the reason Christ came was to offer forgiveness of sin, to give hope, and restitution, reconciliation between God and man. But in the time that we're reading of the high priests, Christ has not come yet. And so what we don't have is a way for mankind to be reconnected with the Father. And so the high priest, his job was to fill the office of connecting man back to God. Next, the high priest was responsible to offer sacrifices and to make atonement for sin. Before Christ came as the ultimate sacrifice, we'll talk about that in a minute, the high priest would offer sacrifices and gifts to make atonement for sins that were made, okay? All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Hebrew narrative, we see where this happens. Grain offerings, animal offerings, whatever it was, they would come and they would say, look, life has been one way, we've done things we shouldn't, we've sinned, there's disconnection, I need to offer something to make reparation before God, okay? And the, the high priest is the one that would offer these atonements for sin. And then lastly, the people of Israel would come to the high priest to have a representative in the presence of God on the day of atonement. Now, half of you are like, what does that mean? Okay, so here's the deal. Scripture tells us that on the seventh month, on the 10th day, July the 10th, I'm joking, their calendar was different then, but on the seventh month, the 10th day was what was called the day of atonement. That once a year, there was a time when the people of Israel could come and the high priest after making sure that he was clean before God, after making sure that he had made restitution for his own sins, that he would go to the place called the Holy of Holies. Now, what does that mean? The Holy of Holies was a special place inside the temple where every year during the time of atonement, the presence of God would descend on that place. And so no one could stand in that place and live except for the high priest, as long as he was standing blameless before God because he had made sure everything was in right standing. And what he would do is, in that moment, he would go into this place where he would stand once a year in the actual presence of God, and he would offer atonement for their families, for their lands, for anything they had done that was wrong, their families had done that was wrong. They would offer some kind of gift in that moment to say, we're going to make it right. Okay, So once a year, he was the representative that would stand before God. It says that there was the throne there. There was a seat that they would say, this is where God, your throne is. And they would come into that place and they would lay the offering on the throne and that because of the sacrifice, atonement was made. Okay, you with me so far? So this is what the high priest did in the time of the people of Israel that we're talking about. Now, there's a few problems with these high priests, okay? There's a few issues that we need to look at this morning to understand fully what is going on here. And the first one is this. He was removed from the people, okay? The high priest was so revered. The high priest was so distinguished. The high priest was such an important position in their culture that, to be honest with you, there was this distance that was created between he and the people. He wasn't just someone you would walk up to on the street and be like, hey, high priest, could I chat for a second? No, no, no. He was removed from the people. He was distant from their day-to-day -day lives, which is why it's so important in a moment when we look at Christ that he's not just some distant figure, but he's a daily reality in our lives. The second thing is this, he too was flawed and sinful. He had to offer sacrifice for himself. He was a human. He made mistakes. He had issues and sin, so it wasn't a perfect situation. He had to constantly offer for himself as well. He had to continue day after day to offer sacrifices and gifts for atonement. There was no long-term solution. There was no long-term solution to the sin issue, and so realistically, this was an ongoing, never-ending process that had to be perpetuated day after day. And he was only allowed into the Holy of Holies one time a year. Once a year could he represent the people in the presence of God. I don't know about you, but I need more connectivity with God than once a year. I need to be able to go before him and surrender my life and my own desires, ask for forgiveness and realignment 
way more than once a year. But as the high priest, they were only allowed in the presence of God like that one time a year. So as we now move into this part of Hebrews that makes the parallel to us that Jesus is the great high priest, let's look at what that means for us this morning. Jesus, our high priest. Jesus is a better sacrifice, and he is a better high priest. What qualifies Jesus to be the high priest? It says the high priest was chosen from among the people, appointed by God. Jesus, in his divineness and his manhood, qualified. Because he was man and had understood what it meant to be tempted in every way, to live a human life, though he was God and man, he was able to be chosen, and he was appointed by God to be the great high priest because of the sacrifice he made on the cross. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, offering himself once and for all as the perfect sacrifice on the cross, and then raising to life again, he was then able to become the better sacrifice and the better high priest. A high priest that is not distant, but that is a daily reality. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. I love this. He's saying, look, we can hold confidently to the faith that we have because Jesus Christ has become our high priest and because he has ascended on high. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. He's saying, look, even though he's divine, even though he's the son of God, even though he is with God on high, he can still empathize because he was fully man when he was on earth. He was tempted in every way like we were, but did not sin. So when he stands before God as this intermediary for us, he understands where we're coming from. And as he intercedes on our behalf, he empathizes with you and I. Jesus as our high priest. So let's look at what it means to have Jesus as our high priest. Just as the people of Israel would go to the high priest to know and understand the will of God, we are able to know the will of God through Jesus as our high priest. James 1.5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, what? Ask, and God will give it abundantly. John 6 and 39 and 40, we're reminded that he will reveal the will of God to us. I don't know about you, but this is something that I need on a regular basis. I need to know what God's want, what God wants of us, where he's leading us, what, what his heartbeat is for us on a regular basis. And so he says, look, as the high priest, you come to me for wisdom, direction, and guidance. He empathizes with our weakness, and he gives us strength. So often, if he doesn't empathize, empathize with us, what happens is we think, you just don't understand where I'm coming from. But it says he was tempted in every way so that as he's interceding for the Father, he understands us and he gives us strength in those moments. We have a way to the Father. Scriptures say that no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so because Jesus Christ is standing there, because he is the high priest that is still that connection between God and man, he says, now because of what I've done, because of who I am, there's now a reconnection available to the Father, that through him we can come to the Father and connect with him. He was the perfect once and for all sacrifice. We see in Hebrews 10, 14 that Jesus paid the price once and for all for all humankind. That he came and because of what he did on the cross, no longer does the high priest have to day after day offer a sacrifice or some kind of offering. No, what we do instead is he has paid that price once and for all. Conquering fear, death, the grave, and sin for all time. So as we live our lives and surrender to him, as we accept Christ and follow as his disciples, that we live in this connection with him where that sacrifice, that gift that he made for us is once and for all. It covers all of that from here through all time. And so there's no longer the need for the old priestly traditions. Jesus paid it all. And lastly, we have a representative in the presence of God on a daily basis interceding for us. You remember that the high priest in the scriptures in the Old Testament would go once a year on the Day of Atonement before him. But Jesus, as the better high priest, stands in the presence of God on a daily basis interceding for you and I. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for you and I. 
So instead of once a year having to hope that you make it that long or are available that day or make the right decision in that moment, he's saying, look, no longer is it just a once a year thing. He said, no, 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 now because of what Christ has done, he stands in the presence of God interceding for you and I. That on a regular basis as we pray, as we seek Christ, he says, look, I'm standing there with the Father. And I say, no, 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 because of what I did on the cross, my son, my daughter, I've got them. See them? See they're surrendering to me? See they're asking for forgiveness? See they're seeking guidance? God, they're one of mine. They're one of mine. That's my son. That's my daughter. And on a daily basis, we no longer have to wait for that one moment. We no longer need an intermediary on earth between us and God. No, Jesus Christ stands there and works on our behalf on a regular basis. And I love that he brings it to one more point. He goes a little deeper. He says, look, here's the deal. If you'll trust me as the great high priest, I have a promise from my father for you. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16, he continues on and says this. Let us then, in light of this, approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I'm going to read that one more time. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, he's not just some figure that's far off. He is a daily presence. He's a daily figure in our lives that on a regular, ongoing, daily basis, he's saying, look, I'm with the Father. And not only that, if you trust me as your high priest, if you've put your hope and your confidence in me, here's what the Father says. Approach the throne with confidence. Now see, the throne would be a place that those that would go on a regular basis would go for judgment. They would go before the king and he would give them some kind of a passing of right, wrong, good, bad. But because of what Christ did, he says, no longer is this a judgment seat. No, 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 now it is a place where you can come with confidence to receive mercy and grace because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice and because he's the great high priest. I love that he says, approach with confidence. How many of you know there's a difference between doing something boldly and with confidence and when you don't? How many of you know there's a difference between just doing something and doing something with confidence? Now, I want to say here, confidence in this scripture is not talking about pride. It's not talking about arrogance. It's not talking about selfish gain. He's not saying this is something that you deserve. No, he's saying, look, I am giving you an invitation. Isn't that beautiful? God invites you and I to approach with confidence. Confidence here equals trust. Confidence equals trust. He's saying, look, you can come because there is trust, because there is confidence between what God has done, what Christ has done. You now have the ability to come to me without holding your head low, without just eking by, but with confidence and boldness because there's trust here to approach me and receive my free gift of grace and mercy. Do you approach the throne of God with grace or with confidence? Do you approach it with boldness? I think if we're honest with ourselves, most of us don't. I think if we're honest with ourselves, most of us don't approach with boldness and we don't approach with confidence. In fact, instead, we just think, you know what, I'm probably not worthy and what I've done is just too bad and you just, it's just too heavy. Honestly, I don't wanna bother God because he's like busy and has a lot going on and other people have bigger issues than I have and so I'm gonna let him take care of the big issues and if you've got a free space in your calendar next week, let me know and then I I might just eke by a little bit and see if you're available. Now we pray prayers that are not bold at all, that are not confident at all. We go to our Father and we're like, God, I know it was my fault and you know, you really shouldn't bail me out because really, I'm the one that messed up. But if you want to, if not, no worries. If you can help me, but if you're too busy, no, no problem. And we pray these like weak, non-committal prayers that are not confident and are not trusting our Father at all. I love when you see someone that does something in confidence because of trust. I love when you watch and someone, because not of their own strength or ability, but because they know the person they're talking to, there's confidence in the way that they approach it. You can see the difference. When people don't want to engage and they go, you know what, I... Mm, and they go to the door three or four times. Should I talk to him? Should I not? Should I talk to him? Should I not? Should I talk to him? Should I not? You've been there. Are the moments when there's confidence, where there's boldness, where they know that because there's trust that they can go and ask anything. My wife talks to me in an honest, clear, brutal, I mean beautiful, (laughs) 
confident way. Why? Because she knows no matter what comes out of her mouth, I will always love her. Because no matter how big or small the request, that she can trust me that I want what's best for her. My kids come to me with such confidence. They trust that anything that needs to be done, that they can trust that I, their father, will do it for them. I've even had moments where my kids, especially Bella, will come to me and she'll be like, Dad, I was telling my friend here, this is my friend so-and-so, that if we go to the store after church, you'll buy them some chips, right? Right? There's no doubt in her mind that she has the trust with me, the confidence and the boldness to come to me and to say, hey, I know your heart. I know who you are. I know what you're all about. And so I told her you'll do it. In that moment, what do you think my response is? How could you? Now I go, of course. Chips for everyone except for me. Confidence changes things, not pride, not arrogance, not selfish gain or motivation, but confidence, trust that we have the ear and the heart of our Father. And he says, look, if you will approach my throne with confidence and boldly, I will give you grace and mercy in your time of need. Do you need grace? I do. Do you need mercy? (laughs) I do. He says, look, this is a free gift that I offer to those who because of what my son, the great high priest, has done, you have access to me. And if you'll trust me as your loving father, I will give you grace. I will give you mercy in your time of need. Oh, friends, we have a great high priest. Our high priest is not some distant figure. He is a daily reality and only when we come to the place where we understand that can we surrender the burdens that we choose to carry and accept his grace only when we understand our high priest can we accept the forgiveness that he offers to us only when we rely on our great high priest on a daily basis can we understand that there is wisdom and direction and guidance available to those who put their trust in him So really, the choice is up to us. Carry it on our own. Try and control it in our own strength and ability. Try and make sense of things so we don't bother him. Or because we accept the free gift that our great high priest has offered to us and because we understand he paid once and for all the price, and because he reconnects us to the Father in a beautiful and profound way, we can then step into a moment and a lifestyle where on a daily basis he invites us to approach the throne, to stand in the presence of God, and to accept his grace and mercy in whatever time of need that we have. Our high priest is not some distant, far-off, disconnected figure. He's a daily reality. Close your eyes. We're going to spend a moment in prayer and reflection in just a second. We're going to spend some time being honest with the Father. Being honest with ourselves. Jesus, you're a better sacrifice. Jesus, you're a better high priest. Thank you for what you've done. What a beautiful and profound image it is that he invites us to come boldly and confidently. I need your grace. I need your mercy. In just a moment, we're going to pray. A moment of reflection just between you and Jesus. And I I want you to be honest this morning. But before we do, we always want to pause and make space to ask this question. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, John, I'm not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've never asked him into your heart. You've never asked him to forgive you, to give you peace and hope and life. But maybe you're here this morning and you would be honest enough to say, John, you know what, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. If that's you, I want to pray with you. 
Or maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, John? I used to be a follower of Jesus. I used to follow in his way, but it's been a really long time since I actually lived for him. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, I could really use a fresh start. If that's you, I want to pray with you as well. Look, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. I just want to believe with you because I know this is the single greatest decision you will ever make in your life. And so if you're here this morning and you say, John, I want to ask Jesus into my heart or John, I need a fresh start. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, just raise your hand right where you are so I can pray with you. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I need a fresh start today. If that's you, just put your hand up and back down so I can pray with you. I need a fresh start. Yeah, I see you. I need a fresh start, John. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. To support our friends that raised their hands, let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of the past. Come into my heart. I accept you as the Son of God. Give me a fresh start. Give me hope and a bright future. Now the Bible says if we ask him to come in, that he does, that he gives us a fresh start. It says the old has gone and the new has come and we're new creations in Christ Jesus. So if you raised your hand, congratulations. Welcome home. At the end of the service, we've got a next step table here in the back. Nick's back there this morning. He'd love to meet you there, give you a Bible, some information on how to go deeper in this journey that you've begun this morning. I'll be here in the front too if you want to chat. Love to hug your neck, pray with you, talk to you for a moment. But congratulations, it's a fantastic day. And now just for the next few moments, right where you are, I want you to sit in a time of prayer and reflection. And I want you to ask these questions, and be honest with the Holy Spirit. Do I accept his free gift of grace? And do I approach God boldly and with confidence? Let's pray for just a moment, reflect for just a moment, and I'll come back and close.